Greetings again, everyone, and welcome to what amounts to the last and really a series of videos you've now listened to so far over the semester about the early formative years of the U.S. government. And in this last video on the subject of politics, we get to the era that I've really always found to be the most fun and interesting, which is the era of Andrew Jackson and the so-called log cabin presidents. This is the era also when the modern style of politics was born, or when the practice of politics came to resemble what we're used to seeing today in modern day elections. And that's with one exception, possibly, and that exception is voter turnout. If you look at the graph on the screen, you can see that after the election of 1824, which was a controversial election that actually had to be decided in the House of Representatives, voter turnout began to steadily increase in the 1800s to levels that really are unheard of today. For example, reaching almost 80% in 1840. And this trend continued into the later 1800s as well, setting up what we could almost consider a heyday of American politics. So it was not only an era when modern politics arose in the 1800s, but it's also an era that's interesting because it's when Americans exercised the right to vote in record numbers. And I'd first like to consider why that might be. The increasing voter turnout corresponded to an increasing level of interest in politics on the part of the public, and that's even among those Americans who weren't eligible to vote, like women. And this rising level of interest can be explained in turn really by multiple factors, I would say. One of them was the election of 1824 that I mentioned previously is a particularly controversial election. This was the year when Andrew Jackson, the popular hero of the War of 1812, first ran for the presidency. He was running against three other candidates, which resulted in no single candidate winning the necessary majority in the Electoral College. Well, when the House of Representatives declared John Quincy Adams the winner, despite Jackson having the higher number of votes, Jackson cried foul and accused Adams of making a so-called corrupt bargain with the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay. Many Americans also believed Jackson that, that something strange had transpired, and they were motivated then to vote in 1828 to clean up the corruption in Washington, D.C. and get Jackson in the White House. But another factor that played a role was economic hardship. People tend to be motivated to vote when the economy takes a downturn and they want the government to take action somehow to ensure a, a quick recovery, if you will. There was a major depression in 1819, or what people then called the panic, and this was hardly the last of the depressions that people in that particular generation lived through. But I would also stress that politics then was really what drove gossip and the rumor mill and tavern talk, much like our celebrity culture or sports do today. In the absence of those other sources of entertainment or recreation, Politics was really what people talked about for fun, in other words. It basically was the pop culture of its day, as I see on the slide here. People talked about candidates like we talk about movies or maybe even viral videos. And Benjamin French, who was a newspaper editor and a county clerk from New Hampshire, said just as much in this diary entry of his from 1828, which was the year that Andrew Jackson ran again for the presidency and won. And you can see Mr. French is saying that politics is what you hear no matter where you go. There are people who talk about it at the ballroom, at the dinner table, even in the stagecoach and the tavern. And you almost get the sense that he's a little annoyed by it, in fact. Well, of course, another big part of the rising voter turnout was that new Americans who recently gained the right to vote were eager to exercise that right and go to the polls. In fact, this rising level of interest in government that we talked about on the last slide helped apply pressure to the states to begin to eliminate the property qualifications that originally had limited the vote to white men of a higher economic standing. As the maps on this slide show, all of the states except for North Carolina and Tennessee 
had eliminated those property qualifications by 1830. And there's a number of states that are shown here in yellow that had adopted what is called universal white male suffrage, which basically means that all white men could vote without exception. And to clarify, if you're not sure of the word suffrage, it's a synonym for the right to vote. So universal white male suffrage, again, means all white men could vote. Well, this development was part of a larger democratization of the political system that is, is usually what's emphasized in this era for the big picture of what's going on. And in addition to allowing men of lower ranks to vote, most of the states also made it so that the voters directly elected the Electoral College, which in turn elected the president. And remember, previously, voters were basically twice removed from the process of electing the president because it used to be that the state representatives whom they voted into office elected the electorals, the electors in the electoral college, not the people themselves. Well, the reforms put in place in this era in the 1800s then created the system that we have today so that the electors of the Electoral College still technically elect the president, but they do so according to the bidding of the people, according to what we tell them to do, in other words. And with that, I will end part one and continue to talk about some other features of this new shift in politics in the second part.